Good afternoon to one and all. Uh, it's a great pleasure in taking part in this webinar on duties of medical officer in case of pricing. I thank our chairman for uh, taking keen interest in arranging series of webinars on various subjects. I would definitely thank our chairman for uh, giving us an opportunity to at the same time, I also thank the guest speaker, Dr. Rajan, who has accepted our uh, forensic process request and uh, talking about the duties of the medical officer in uh, poisoning. It's a very important topic for one and all, so not only for physicians, for all the uh, undergraduates, for all the practicing doctors. Poisoning is, a, is an emergency. Everyone must know about the various kinds of poisoning and its management and its medical implications. All those things, they must know it. I think the Department of Forensic Medicine, congratulate them for organizing such a very common topic which will be useful to one and all. And I, once again, congratulate them for giving an opportunity. <coughs> Thank you very much for Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we call upon Dr. S. Ramsarit, sir, Professor of the HD of Department of General Medicine, Anna Medical College, Good afternoon, all the delegates. So I, uh, I thank for the this speaker, Dr. Rajan, as well as the participants. So we heartful thanks for our chairman and to the Department of Forensic Medicine to organize this such a wonderful, useful topic regarding all the primary physicians, those who are in the casualty and those who are in the emergency wards to intervene the medical legal aspect as well as the management of uh, toxicology. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome once again, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Dr. Vijay Kumari M, Professor of the HBO Policy Medicine to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. On behalf of the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, Alabama Medical College and Hospital in Salem, it's really a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to a very talented, young and dynamic guest speaker, Dr. Rajan S., who is currently pursuing super specialization in medical and forensic toxicology at Ames, Raipur. He has accepted our invitation even in his busy schedule. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajan. Dr. Rajan completed his undergraduation from Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Medical College, Bangalore, and MD in Forensic Medicine and Toxicology from Shimoga Institute of Medical Sciences, Karnataka. At present, he is pursuing his DM in Medical and Forensic Toxicology in one of the most premium institutes, that is Ames Raipur. And I am proud to say that he is the first DM candidate in this field in India. Congratulations, Dr. Rajan. Apart from his innovative teaching, he also has keen interest in various activities, especially clinical toxicology. To his credit, he has uh, many national and international publications. With this brief introduction, let us move on to the scientific session. And uh, on request before going to the session, I request all the participants to post their questions in the chat box and it will be discussed by the speaker at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now I call upon Dr. S. Ramsar, sir, and Dr. Vijay Kumar, ma'am, to chair the session. Let's move on to the session now. Uh, sir, we can start your presentation and share your knowledge with us now. We are eagerly waiting to listen to you. It's over to you, sir. Dr. Rajan, you can start your session. And am I audible? Yes, yes. yes. It's clear. Okay. Sorry, I have a technical problem. Yeah. 
like i can't hear ma'am am i audible right yes. audible audible can you hear us na naga pesadhu kekkuda yeah i can hear you okay so thank you ma'am thank you to thanks to dr vijay kumar ji for the sudan ma and uh, dean sir of tamilnadu medical college for inviting me to uh, speak here in this forum uh, i'll share the screen ma so i'll be talking on duties of medical officer in case of a poisoning so here i heard like uh, most of the audience here who are uh, crr experience of that so there's a very important topic there and if they are working in casualty or emergency on their right they're going to work in uh, hospitals so quite an important topic for doctors so before going into the topic i would like to give the uh, statistics on the point am i audible right yes yes yeah right. okay so poisoning cases are like they are the significant contributor to both mortality and morbidity throughout the world so it is like present uh, poisoning cases are more common both in developed as well as the developing countries so it's actually equally distributed like even the developing developed countries also have lot of poisoning cases only the thing is differences Uh, the type of poisoning may be for like in developed countries it's more of the prescription medicines and in developing countries it can be of more of uh, household poison so or insecticides or pesticides only the difference can be of various types of poisoning it can be for but all over the world there are like poisoning cases more number of significant number of poisoning cases are there so this uh, according to who 2017 statistics Uh, gives us around 20.2 deaths for 100,000 population per year. So this is a significant number. It comes around like more than two million, two hundred thousand deaths are there, and around three million acute poisoning cases all over the world. And coming to India, again here also it is more around fifty thousand deaths in India are due to acute poisoning cases. So significant number of poisoning cases are there in uh, the world and also in India. so poisoning cases it's not like can be seen only in multi specialty hospitals or the medical colleges can also uh, doctors working in uh, primary health centers or small nursing home can enter in count of poisoning cases so when this kind of poisoning cases are there they should be able to manage the poisoning cases and poisoning cases which is also a medical illness so as a doctor you should be able to treat the patient and also you should fulfill the legal responsibilities there are certain legal responsibilities when it is a medical legal case so you also should uh, do those uh, legal duties so both it requires both medical treatment as well as the medical legal duties so as i told it is a medical legal case i want to stress what actually is a medical legal case because there are more students here i want to tell like Uh, what actually a medical legal case is? So medical legal case is nothing but a medical case with a legal implication or a legal case requiring a medical expertise. It can be a medical case where the patient has come only for the treatment, but the doctor feels like they require some legal implications or a legal inquiry into it, or it is a exclusive a legal case where which does not require any treatment, but requires a medical expertise to prove the uh, crime or any of the legal act, uh, formalities i can give an example here uh, there was a uh, few months back uh, there was a case in kerala where a female patient was brought to the hospital with a history of snake bite i would like to put a, a positive case only here so this patient was brought to the hospital with a history of snake bite and was brought by husband and given a history saying that uh, there was snake bite uh, for the woman at the uh, at his uh, residence and he witnessed the snake he saw he saw the snake and he threw the snake out and later he brought the 
uh, patient to the hospital. So this was the history given. This is the medical case where it requires the treatment of the patient. And it is a history is simple and as an accidental uh, snake bite. So there's nothing much of legal inquiry here. But doctor suspected something and he informed police. So he taken the doctor taken a history from the patient father also. So father given history stating that one month back he had the woman suffered from snake bite and she was treated and she recovered. So two times she had a snake bite. So he informed the police, the doctor informed the police. So police also conducted an inquiry. So during uh, inquiring all the uh, relatives and also the husband, they started searching the uh, husband's phone. So while uh, seeing the husband's phone, his search history, his Google search history was last one or two months, it was more of a uh, snake related things. He was searching like uh, different types of snakes, venomous snakes, then uh, like uh, how to induce a snake bite. So all these things were issues. So it was like suspicious. And then his phone calls also were traced. So there they found there was a snake charmer. So the police contacted him and, and the snake charmer revealed that her husband uh, purchased two venomous snakes from the snake charmer. So after that, they inquired him and husband revealed that he tried to kill his wife. So it was not the first time. The earlier also he tried, but uh, she was like uh, survived that. Treatment was done and she survived. And second time again after the month, he tried this. So it is a medical case. It is a uh, typical medical case brought to the hospital. And history is very simple, more common. Actually, snake bites are most of the time it is an accident. So, but thorough investigations led here, it was a homicide. So it's a medical case which required a legal inquiry into it to prove a crime occurred with that uh, medical case. So a medical case which requires any legal implications considered as a medical legal case. And coming to legal case, legal cases which requires medical expertise. So this, I can quote an example as a uh, case of drunkenness. Um, for example, a person like uh, consumed alcohol and driving. So police catches him and they want to prove that he is uh, driving under the influence of alcohol. So to prove this, they need a medical examination. So this is a typical legal case. They want to prove that the person was under the influence of alcohol while driving. There's nothing related to treatment here. But to prove that, they require a medical examination. So it's a legal case, required a medical, uh, medical expertise. So this is the medical legal cases. So medical legal cases can be a medical case or a legal case requiring the, either the legal implications or the medical uh, expertise. So this is about the medical legal case. And also, as a doctor, we are treating uh, patients and uh, treating the medical legal cases also. There is a section called 30, uh, 39 CRPC from the 39 uh, Criminal Procedure Code. So according to this, the public have to give information of certain offenses. So this offenses can be examples like homicide, rape. So all these things, uh, public are duty bound to give information to the police. Here, doctors. By treating a patient, we have the first hand knowledge by history and uh, examination of the patient, or also, like for uh, example, in poisoning cases, we have the evidentiary materials also. So, we are duty bound to inform to the police. So, if we are not informing, there are some penalties also in there, which I will be telling in the uh, later slides. So, for any medical legal case, we are duty bound to inform to the police. And to register a medical legal case, to register a medical legal case, it is the discretion of the doctor. It need not be like uh, you take the consent from the patient or the relatives to register the case as a medical legal case. The treating doctor, he has the power to uh, register the case as a medical legal case. He need not have any permission or consent from the patient or patient relatives. If he feels any medical case has to be reported to the police, has to be informed to the police. It is at this discretion he can inform to the police without any like, permission from the patient or the patient relatives. So, poisoning cases, whenever it is being brought to the hospital, so the responsibility of the doctor is not only the treatment, but he also has to maintain the legal formalities following the treatment. 
you have to do both medical treatment as well as also the legal formalities. Uh, many times the poisoning cases, it comes uh, to the emergency or the casualty rather than the OPD. So there it is uh, it requires a more of a prompt medical attention and doctors also while treating the patient involuntarily they neglect the there are chances that in some centers they involuntarily neglect doing the medical legal formalities so they don't register the case also as a medical legal case the documentations are not done properly so this is uh, more common uh, in a small peripheral centers or the small nursing homes where the patient has been brought when not much facilities are there to treat they give only the first aid or they uh, do the decontamination stabilize the patient and they refer to the higher centers. So while they are doing the first aid and referring, they also should register the case as MNC, but uh, sometimes they don't do it. They just give first aid and refer, they think like the other higher centers, they can register the case as MNC. But according to law, if any death occurred or something occurred, so the law will, the court may ask the doctor who treated the first, the doctor who treats the patient first is always called for the evidence because he has the sound knowledge of the patient, first hand knowledge on the patient. So if the doctor has not registered the case with MLC, he has not documented things, so it can be difficult for them. Sometimes it can be, uh, it can be penalized also for them. So whenever poisoning cases is being brought, even though it is a periphery center, even though like you are just giving the first aid and the referee, Register the case as MLC and document like what all you have done. You have to document and you have to refer the patient. So wherever, wherever it is, even though like you are just giving first aid, give uh, to the MLC. So poisoning cases coming to the hospitals, it can be of intentional poisoning or unintentional poisoning. So intentional poisoning can be of suicide or homicide. And anti unintentional can be accidental poisoning. Intentional is like the patient want to harm himself and he takes, so that is a suicidal poisoning, or uh, want to harm others can be homicidal poisoning. Unintentional or the accidental is like uh, accidentally they are taking, thinking that to be something else and accidentally consuming, and it's going to be a poisoning case. And number three is the homicidal poisoning. It's more of if you uh, see more poisons coming to the hospital, it will be more of accidental and very rarely homicidal poisoning. This is because like a more number of tests have come to detect the poisons. So homicidal poisoning are still coming down. So as I told you, uh, for the management of poisoning cases, it should be both treatment as well as the legal duties of the doctor. So first I will talk about the medical duties of the doctor that is managing a case medically. So this uh, medical treatment is a vast one. Uh, toxicology is a vast one. I will just give you an overview. Uh, mainly the medical centers uh, So when a patient is being brought, the First minute primary survey. This is very important. So before taking the history, before going to know about what poison he has consumed, you have to um, do this primary survey, initial assessment. You have to stabilize the patient. So initial assessment and resuscitation. That stabilization of the patient. So it includes uh, waiting for the vitals. The first one minute survey. So you look for the vitals, airway, breathing, and circulation. So vitals can be catalogued for the pulse, uh, blood pressure, temperature, then uh, uh, saturation levels, oxygen saturation levels, level of consciousness, then pupils, and also sometimes you can uh, look for uh, if any vomit is present. So all these things uh, not only gives the like, what is the condition of the patient, it also can give clue type of poison is taken. Some toxidromes can give a clue. For example, I can tell like uh, if a patient is with uh, bradycardia, with bradypnea, and with uh, uh, constricted pupils and sweating and all those things, it, it gives a clue like uh, it can be because of an organ of phosphorus poisoning. Or a patient with uh, 
uh, coming with uh, tachycardia, tachycardia, then uh, increased sweating and uh, dilated pupils. It can be of symptomatic drugs. So just assessing the vitals, you can have a clue like what type of poison the patient would have consumed. Also, you have to they are present, uh, intubation can be done, then look for hyperventilation or hyperventilation, then uh, blood pressure, so that you can stabilize, initial stabilization of the patient is very much important. So after that, you can take the history. So while taking history, you have to ask for what is the exposure. So what, what, what type of poison the person has consumed. Many a times they can be whiskey, like uh, if the patient is in a critical condition where he's not able to talk, the relatives can be a history, or sometimes they may bring just an unconscious patient. There'll be no history at all. So if you have to uh, start treating the patient uh, by uh, assessing the patient. Or sometimes they can be like, if they themselves can bring the empty poison bottle or uh, empty blisters of the uh, tablets or the drugs. So based on that, you will get to know the exposure. Then you should also know the root of exposure, whether they have consumed orally, they have taken IV or through dermal or eye contact. So you have to ask for the exposure, again, to the uh, various modalities of treatment. If known, you also should ask for the quantity of poison. Not the poison bottle, if something is remaining in the bottle. So you will get to know like how much they would have consumed or a bottle of uh, uh, tablets which consists of around 30 to 40, 10 tablets or so rest of the things are missing. So how much they would have consumed so that you can ask. Then other one important thing is time of exposure. When they have consumed the poison or when was the exposure and when they are presenting to the hospital. So the time interval between the exposure and the presentation to the hospital. This is uh, important because of uh, decontamination. If the person has been brought in the initial stage within one hour or like within four to six hours where the gastric emptying occurs. So before that uh, patient is being brought, the person can be given, can be given a stomach wash of gastric lavage and can decontaminate the patient. But if it was a delay, uh, the patient is being brought after eight hours or 10 hours, then we need not to uh, unnecessarily expose the patient for stomach wash. It, it may not be required. So that time, like most of the poisons have been absorbed, and we need not to do stomach wash. So the time of exposure is also important. And any events before they brought to the hospital, like the person is vomited, so those kind of history you can ask. So uh, this is about the history, like we'll collect various details, you can know about the poison. Sometimes history can be helpful or uh, history may not be helpful. They may not give history at all. They can tell, like uh, the person was, uh, the relatives can tell when we went into the room, the person was lying unconscious and was being brought to the hospital. Then, after taking history, the preliminary basic investigations are required and always secure a white door cannula. You have to secure the IV line, the white door uh, cannula, and you have to do the basic investigation, preliminary basic investigation while securing the IV line. You can uh, take the blood and send for the basic investigations, which is passed in all cases of poisons. The common things are complete blood count, serum electrolytes, blood gas analysis, then uh, serum creatine, uh, blood urea nitrogen, ECG, all the things. So important thing is uh, serum electrolytes we have to do. The importance of this is, so most of the poisons act on this uh, various channels, sodium channels or potassium channels. They de derange the uh, serum electrolytes. So we we'll get to know like what is the derangement and also the blood gas analysis. So here like uh, the analysis, uh, I mean, uh, the, they can again derange the pH levels and uh, they can lead to metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. So we we'll get to know what type of poisonings are there. So if there are no proper history, so we we'll get to know by this basic investigation what type of poisoning it can, it can lead to some clues on what type of poisoning we are dealing with. Like for example, like uh, methanol or any of the alcohols are there, it can give, uh, show metabolic acidosis with anion gap. So by this, it can give a clue for the treatment. And ECG, most of the poisons again are toxic to the heart. They can uh, 
that's myocarditis. So we may get to know uh, by doing an ECG. Uh, there are poisons like which can affect the liver, uh, like parastomol or paraquet. So the liver function test also will be helpful. So these are the uh, preliminary basic investigations to be done. And if uh, based on the history, you get to know like uh, what actually the poison they have consumed. You also can do the specific toxin levels. For example, in organo phosphorus, so you can do the serum polynesterase levels, RBC serum pol RBC polynesterase, or the serum polynesterase levels can be done, or the parastomal levels can be done, or navy metals, the blood lead level or blood mercury level. So this uh, do it. Like if uh, history is like they leave like what exact poison they have consumed, or else like it is not much helpful. Then like if the patient is being brought like uh, within one hour or maximum four to six hours. So you can do the decontamination, mainly like uh, most of the time uh, we get poison as a orally consumed poison. So which requires a stomach wash. So stomach wash can be done if it is being brought before like four to six hours. Preferably if it is being brought less than one hour, you have to do a gastric lavage or a stomach wash. Or up to four to six hours, you can do it. Beyond that, it is not much helpful because the gastric emptying occurs uh, by around four to six hours. So it is not much helpful. Sometimes in sustained release uh, medic medications or any sustained release uh, uh, tablets have been taken, then you can uh, consider doing the uh, gastric levels even after uh, uh, four hours. Or many times you can do whole bowel irrigation in this kind of setup. And if it is a dermal or eye contact, it requires a thorough washing, copious washing with uh, water or saline. And in eye contact, if it is there in uh, eye contact, again, it requires like it has to be irrigated. Why well, I should be irrigated at least for 15 minutes with uh, saline. So this is how the decontamination has to be done. If the poison is absorbed, then, then we have to try for elimination of the poison from the blood. So this can be a uh, forced diuresis or urine alkalinization. Uh, acidification that is like uh, for if so you know that it's a weak acid or a weak base so alternatively we can do the urine and alkalinization or acidification suppose like uh, there, there are acidic drugs so you can do urine alkalinization by giving sodium bicarbonate so this the weak acids will not be uh, reabsorbed they become ionized and then can be eliminated the same thing like for the uh, basic drugs can do the acidification. Also, the post diuresis to so increase the blood volume uh, and can do for post diuresis. This also can be done, but this is again it can lead to pulmonary edema and cerebral edema. So uh, not much done. And in certain poisons, hemodialysis and hemoperfusion also can be done. For example, in case of lithium or in uh, case of methanol, where low molecular weight poisons are there. So here, better to do a hemodialysis or also hemoperfusion, where uh, like uh, absorbent, like um, activated charcoal will be present over the semi-permeable membrane, and blood is being passed through it, and which can absorb the, the xenobiotics or the any of the poisons. So this can be tried. Then there's the specific therapy. Specific therapy or the antidote therapy. So this is uh, cannot be done for all the poisons because most of the poisons don't have a specific antidote. There are certain poisons which have their specific antidotes. So if those poisons are known, you can give an uh, antidote. For example, in uh, poisoning, organophosphates, so they have uh, the antidote as atropin and pralidoxine can be given. Or in parastamol, n can be given, and opioids, naloxone, uh, cyanides, the uh, sodium nitrate. These are some examples where the antidotes are present for the poisons. So if antidotes are there, you can give antidotes, but there are various poisons which don't have a specific antidotes. For example, take aluminum phosphate. Aluminum poison phosphate is more common in North India, where like frequently get these cases, but there is no any specific antidote for that. It requires only the supportive therapy. So you, you, you need not to go for like finding a specific antidote for that, or else for a paraquet poisoning. Then it doesn't have a proper like specific antidote. So it requires a support therapy. So whichever poison has this antidote, you can uh, be the antidotes. 
the main main thing in case of poisoning is the supportive therapy uh, initial decontamination and the supportive therapy supportive therapy is important uh, in all the poisons more than your specific antidote therapy because the antidotes are present only for few poisons for various other poisons you are symptomatically you, you are giving a supportive therapy like if the patient is in a shock you have to give iv fluids then vasopressors so like that you will treat the shock you will correct the acidosis or in case of respiratory failure ventilation is required so this kind of supportive therapy forms the major treatment in case of poison so this is in a nutshell about a medical treatment in case of poison so whenever a patient comes the first thing is the primary survey so if you have to uh, assess the patient for the vitals and stabilize the patient initially then you go for history taking and if the patient has been brought early you can do a, a gastric decontamination by doing a stomach wash and then you can give the antidote therapy or to treat the patient supportively so this is in a nutshell or an overview of uh, poisoning cases so next i will talk about the medical legal duties i am audible right so am i audible yes 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 dr rajan i got something okay so the medical legal duties the important one in case of poisoning which is most of the time that is neglected so medical treatment in all the centers they try to treat the patient but uh, the medical legal duty slightly it has been neglected so i'll tell like what all the uh, legal formalities to be uh, done by the doctor in the first in the first slide itself i told the medical duty you have to register the case at the police so that forms the important thing so whenever any poisoning case comes you have to register it as an mlc case and you have to inform the police so the first thing in medical legal duties is regarding consent i would like to talk on consent so consent for registering mlc and consent for treatment based on consent yeah for registering mlc as i told you on the previous slide itself I, uh, you don't require a consent of the patient to it is a discretion of the doctor if a doctor feels like it has to be you can inform the police this is not only for the poisoning case any of the mlc cases not only mlc case any case if a doctor is treating a patient he feels like some legal inquiry is required even though it can be a like a um, myocardial infarction case comes a mi case comes he feels the doctor feels like it requires some legal inquiry we can inform the police it need not be only certain cases has to be registered as mlc any medical case if the doctor feels he can inform the police and he can register the case as an mlc for this patient or patient related permission of the consent is not required but many times when we are there a, a casualty the patient relatives can ask so we don't want to to make this case a police case many times they can come and plead Uh, we don't want to make this case, so uh, you need not inform them. Also, like you're going to be in an MSC, and you can register the case in an MSC and inform the police. Consent is not required. And uh, they say like the section 39 CRPC, all the cases like homicide or anything that is required, you are duty bound to inform the police. You are uh, mandatory. You have to inform the police. For certain cases, for example, uh, you can think like uh, a mild poisoning case comes, accidental mild poisoning case comes, and they ask like we don't want to inform the police. So it, it is not related to anything as uh, uh, doesn't like, want any uh, legal inquiry. For example, I can give uh, cases. Uh, suppose like uh, we had one case where a patient came with issue of battery water as poisoning. So here he came with very mild poisoning. he just taken one sip of uh, this person is working in a, a center where they uh, recharge the batteries where they use top of the this battery water and recharge this batteries so here this person has consumed the water it was uh, kept in a water bottle this battery water uh, acid which consists of 
um, uh, mild sulfuric acid in the distilled water. So this was kept in a water bottle. He thought it to be uh, water and he started taking it. So once he taken it, he got to know this is the he immediately spit it out. It was just a one split, one split he has taken. But after that, he developed hoarseness of voice and burning uh, sensation. So he was brought to the hospital. It was a mild poisoning. Immediately he spit it out. Nothing happened. He came walking to the hospital. And on examination, he just had an ulcer over the soft palate. And he was kept in observation and he was treated and was sent in like after two days. Not much was required. So this is a mild case of poisoning and it is an accidental poisoning. History is clearly suggested for accidental poisoning. And patient also doesn't want to make it as an MLC. And section 39 CRPC also doesn't tell like uh, any of the accidental cases to not matter. But as a doctor, we should not believe in the history. So he, even the history is unknowingly he taken and consumed the water. This also can be a suicidal poisoning. Suppose like he was in depression uh, or something scolded him, his boss scolded him or anything, something would have happened. So there were, he knows that always uh, the battery was put in a water bottle in that case. And he, he for committing suicide, he would have taken. It is like a burning sensation. He was not able to consume much more, so he spit it out. That also can be there. It could have been also a suicidal poison. Or somebody wanted to kill him for some reason. So they know daily he may drink water from the same water. Instead of water into that, and it okay. So only this person has taken, but unfortunately he spit it out. Like he has not consumed the food. So it can be homicidal, it can be suicidal, or it can be accidental. We are, doctor, we are not the first witness. We have not seen that. We are listening only to the history. So based on the history, we cannot make that is an accidental or a suicidal or a homicide. So any case of poisoning it comes. So it's better we should inform to the police. Can be as an accidental also. But better we can inform to the police and they will do the legal inquiry. Our thing is like just informing the police. No end of like whether it's an accidental poisoning will not be reported or suicidal poisoning. There are some uh, uh, the books or some things mentions like in case of like uh, accidental poisoning, need not to inform the police. So, but like it is better always in any case of poisoning, any case of poisoning comes to the hospital, better to inform the police and we will do the investigation and after that, whether to continue the investigation or not, it, it is up to the police. So we, we are not the uh, eyewitness, or we are not the first time witness, we have not seen what happened at the crime scene. So we don't, based on the issue, we cannot the accidental better leave it to the police. So in all the cases, all cases of course, we register the cases MLC. Then consent for treatment. So consent for treatment, like when a patient comes the treatment, it is like implied the person gives the consent. But sometimes there are some cases like the person come, wanted to commit suicide, but he was uh, being brought to the hospital. He may say that he doesn't want treatment. He wants to die. He may refuse the treatment. So what are you supposed to do? So you, to treat a patient, always the concern of the patient is essential. The patient's autonomy, we have to respect the patient's autonomy and we have to uh, there is concern of the patient is not treated. So what to do in this type of cases? In Western countries, uh, there are some case reports and uh, also some studies where this lonely elderly people, they when they commit suicide, they write the DNR and the advanced directives stating that they should not be treated, terminally, uh, the treatment should not be done for them. So there are studies like where they write the DNRs and then they commit the suicide. So what, what do we do? Whether the treatment we have to do or not, the consent treatment. Sure, because uh, in India, like actually still now, the is still in an infertile stage, still it has not come to the other uh, existence of the law. Sure, in India, we can treat the patient based on the section uh, 88 IPC at 89. Actually, the concept. 
so anything which is done in the in a good faith for the benefit of the individual it is not an offence so section 88 tells that and section 89 tells that anything done in a good faith and for the benefit of a child less than 12 years or unsound mind person or if you are going to save the life of the individual or you are going to cure any of the grievous uh, injuries or the grievous uh, infirmity so in those cases you can treat the patient without the concern so you can treat if the patient is in a critical stage you want to save the life of the individual so in that case even if they are not consenting you can treat the patient you can uh, use the section 88 and 89 for that so this is about the consent and for registration uh, registering the mlc then important thing is collection and preservation of the evidential materials so again most of the doctors they concentrate on treating the patient so they neglect like while treating or while doing the gastric lavage while doing the stomach wash they discard the samples they don't collect it and keep or like uh, when uh, decontaminating the patient the clots will be removed and it will be discarded so all these things has to be preserved because later the court may ask for this evidentiary material or the police may ask for the evidentiary materials so the soil clots the patient has vomited the vomit is present on the clots so that has to be taken segregated and has to be uh, preserved or they can bring any of the empty poison bottles or the empty blister of the drugs the use and uh, the electro the drug uh, sample sheets are there so those things if the patient brings so again those has to be preserved that can be sent for the fsl for doing the chemical analysis and compare it with the uh, uh, things from the uh, like body fluids and gastric lavage sample whenever you are doing a gastric lavage suppose a person was brought within the time span and gastric lavage or stomach wash is done so in that case you should not discard the entire uh, thing you should not discard at least a portion of the stomach wash sample has to be preserved and also the blood and urine so this blood and urine you need not be preserving in all the cases in certain things like if you are uh, the specific poisons can be detected so there can be some poisons which cannot be detected or which forms a metabolite so need not be done or whenever you are sending the samples like for example paracetamol poisoning or in the organ of the so when you are uh, taking a blood you are sending the samples for the toxin levels so those reports can be preserved so all the samples whatever you collect it should be properly packed labeled and sealed so uh, there are certain instances like when we are doing autopsies uh, especially in cases like a paracetamol poisoning where the person dies like after like for five or six days where in autopsy there will be nothing in the uh, stomach or even the organs also may not be it is sent for chemical analysis may not reveal like the uh, uh, toxins or the poisons in the from the organs or the viscera so that time like we usually ask if the gastric if the person was treated and gastric lavage was uh, done and it has been documented in the you know, case sheets we instruct the uh, investigating officer to collect the gastric gastric lavage sample or the stomach wash sample and send for the uh, fsl but many times they go and uh, like come back and they say like uh, stomach wash was discarded so it was not preserved so it becomes a, a difficulty the situation for the doctor would be there because later in a court if the treated doctor is being called for giving evidence so it becomes like difficult for him like he doesn't have a sample and he also can be penalized for that like for uh, 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 making the uh, sample to be lost so for that he can be penalized for that also so in all the cases whenever you are like uh, having any of this evidentiary materials like clots or the poor empty bottle or the gastric sample everything has to be preserved so this again preservation is not like a few days it can be a few months or one year also you have to preserve so it should be because the investigating officer may come after three months or six months or so they initially they take the viscera for the fsl so everything will come negative then there it can come to the hospital for asking for the stomach wash sample they see in the patient stick that there's been stomach wash has been done then later they can come and ask for the stomach wash sample so it has to be kept for a longer time so it should be properly packed 
label it like uh, the name of individual, age of the individual, sex of the individual, what sample is it? So when was it collected? Everything has to be properly labeled and it should be properly sealed so that the confidentiality is maintained. So all the samples should be properly packed, labeled, and sealed. So this is up to you have to preserve the evidentiary method. Whatever evidentiary materials are there in the quality cases, you have to collect it and you have to preserve it. Then documentation. In any of the MLC cases, not only in any of the MLC cases, documentation is very important. Right from the patient enter into the hospital up to discharge or death of it, all the facts should be documented. What are all things you observed? Like what are the procedures done? What are the laboratory investigations done? Samples collected? Everything should be properly documented. And some of the important negative findings. Suppose like in poisoning case, the patient was brought late. So you have not done the uh, stomach wash. So that to be documented. So some important negative findings also will be required to be documented with proper time and date. So in all MLC cases, documentation is very important. So the section 61 to 90 of Indian Evidence Act, it deals with the documentary evidence. So section 61, which is important for us, which says that content of the documents may be proved either by primary or secondary evidence. So if the documentation proper, the things are properly documented, it can act as a primary evidence. The doctor need not be called to give oral evidence on that. The cases or the document which is present, that itself can act as a primary evidence. So if the documentation is perfect, everything is there. So if something is missing, they can call the doctor for giving oral evidence also. Or sometimes, even if it's all proper also, they can call the doctor to give the evidence. This is a secondary evidence. So this, if a document, you have to maintain the documents properly. And maintenance of the documents, maintenance of record. So in all cases of MLC, the record should be maintained definitely. Now, like all, like, uh, get the soft copies. So it requires to be maintained as a, a soft copy, or at least as a summary for indefinite period. So or at least for minimum of 10 years, it has to be maintained. In a normal uh, OPD case or an IPD case, like you maintain up to three years, and in IPD you can maintain up to five years. But in MLC cases, minimum of 10 years, you have to maintain the uh, records. And after that, uh, if you're not able to maintain the hard copies, you can maintain as a soft copy or as a summary, it should be maintained for an indefinite period. So this is about the documentation. So in all MLC cases, you have to document properly and it has to be maintained. Whenever they summon the doctor, you have to able to uh, give the documentation regarding the case. Then in certain cases, you have to give information or notify the public health authorities. So one is you are informing the police. You are registering the case as emergency, you are informing the police. In certain cases, you also should inform the public health authorities. For example, like, uh, multiple similar type of poisoning cases from a same source. For example, of food, food poisoning cases. So in this case, you have to inform the health inspector or the public health authority has to be informed. For example, I can tell you uh, recently, a few months back, uh, again in Tamil Nadu, there was uh, from a restaurant, uh, eight or nine year old kid uh, died after consumption of uh, food from the restaurant and also few other people uh, suffered uh, food poisoning. And after that, it was informed and all over Tamil Nadu, they did, uh, uh, went for all the restaurants and they seized a uh, few uh, foul meat and all from the restaurants. So this requires notification. If the case comes, if multiple cases are there, it requires notification to the public health authorities also. For uh, another example, like from toxic waters, from well or pond, because of effluence in uh, left into the ponds, so these kind of uh, conditions, not only you are registering as a, your duty is to register the case as the MLC and info, you also should notify to the public health authorities. So this is also one of the important uh, legal response of the doctor in case of poisoning. Then dying declaration. Suppose the patient is on the verge of death and the patient wants to give declaration on the manner of the person's death. 
So doctor has to arrange for dying declaration by informing the police or the magistrate. So you have to uh, inform the magistrate for for the dying declaration. If there is no time for the magistrate or the police to come there, the doctor himself can record the dying declaration. So this is also again a important uh, legal responsibility of the doctor. In case like patient wishes to uh, give a declaration on man or death or uh, the death, you record the declaration, inform the magistrate or the police. If there is no time for them to come in, before that the patient may die or uh, it is urgent, the doctor himself can record the dying declaration. And it is a valid and court of law. Suppose a death occurs. So a uh, poison patient is being brought and patient dies uh, after the treatment. So here, as a treating doctor, you are not supposed to issue a cause of death certificate. That is the MCC, medical cause of death certificate, should not be issued if any uh, MLC cases, not only in poisoning, any of the MLC cases, the person dies, should not issue a cause of death certificate. Rather, police has to be informed and body should be subjected to post medical autopsy. Then, cause of the certificate will be issued after the autopsy, the post mortem certificate, or MCCD after the autopsy. So, never issue in any case of poisoning, and if it is done as an MLC, never issue a cause of the certificate. Always subject the body for autopsy, and only then the post mortem certificate or the cause of the certificate will be issued by Dr. Over conducted. So, those were the few uh, legal. So, in this slide, I will tell if they are not fulfilling that legal responsibilities, they can be punished or how they can be penalized. So, they can be penalized for patients. We should give notice or information to the public servant by a person legally bound to give. So, a doctor CRKT is legally bound to give information because he has the first hand evidentiary material than regarding the uh, knowledge about the poisoning case. So he is duty bound to inform the police. And if he is not giving notice or if he is not informing the police, a doctor can be penalized under this section 176 IPC. So the punishment here for 176 IPC is around six months simple imprisonment. So doctor may undergo, if, if he, he can go undergo like six months uh, simple imprisonment or with a fine or it can be both. So other section is section 201 IPC. So this is causing disappearance of evidence of the offense or giving false information to screen the offender. So here I, I told you in the previous slides, if the doctor like uh, do a gas gastric lavage, but they have not collected the samples. So that is unintentionally you don't have collected the sample. So he just uh, done uh, done the gastric lavage and he discarded. It didn't have any intention uh, of like to cause the disappearance. But he may be booked under the section two not one IPC. He has done some procedure, but he has not preserved it. So if he is not preserving means like he tried to manipulate or he tried to cause disappearance of the evidence, the defense may try to prove this and he may be punished. So that is the reason like whenever you are doing the gastric lovers uh, stomach wash, try to preserve and all the evidentiary may be missed. Try to preserve in case of poisoning or else can be punished on this do not want IPC causing disappearance of the evidence of the offense or giving false information. So for, for this, the punishment depends on the what punishment the accused may get. Suppose like the punishment for the accused is a capital punishment, like a, a death punishment is there. So then the person who is booked under section 201 IPC, that is a doctor, suppose like he's causing the disappearance of the evidence, he may be punished for seven years of simple imprisonment. It depends on like what punishment the accused are getting. If the accused is being punished with a lifetime imprisonment, then uh, a person who's uh, under the scheme of an IPC, they may be punished for three years imprisonment. Or if it is anything less than uh, 10 years of imprisonment for the accused, it is one fourth of the uh, punishment for the 
person booked on the 2019 IPs. So here it, it depends on what punishment the accused may get. And section 202 IPC, it is intentional omission to be information of offense by person bound to inform. It's similar to like uh, section 176, where is like intentionally it doesn't want to give information to the uh, like person bound to inform, like uh, to the police or the magistrate. You have to inform, but intentionally or omitting. You think like uh, it is just an um, accidental uh, false in case. I need not to inform. But later on investigation, it got to be known as a homicidal poison. So you may be uh, booked under, like intentionally you have omitted to inform the police. So it can be booked under section 202 IPC. Here again, the punishment is similar to 176. It is around six months imprisonment with or without fine. He may, the person has to pay only fine or may undergo six months of imprisonment or it can be both. So these are the various penal laws which may be applicable for the doctors. It is not exclusive for the doctor. It is, uh, in case of MLC, it may be applicable for the doctors for treating the poison offenses. So, by this, I wrap up my uh, presentation. Thank you all for patient listening. Then, questions are going to get an answer. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, for your excellent speech and uh, sharing your knowledge. Uh, you nicely highlighted that the ignorance of law is not an excuse. And you also explained the various medical legal duties of uh, doctors and its implications. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Any questions? Yes, sir, regarding. Uh, The poison, sir, the preliminary basic management you already explained, sir. The specific management also depends upon the category of the uh, presentation of the patient as well as uh, the so individual poison should be treated according to the uh, specification. Either it may be a snake envenomation or otherwise an OPC poison or plant poisons like that. But everything after treatment, if death occurs, what is the role of the medical officer to hand over the body to the either relatives or to the police people or to the autopsy center? That is the question. Usually, they, they okay. will pressure the okay. doctor to hand over the body to the relatives. So, they are agitated and they will hand over the body to the relatives. So, what is the protocol should be followed? In continuation, okay. of, this, yes. in continuation of this question, some people, for example, uh, uh, opiate, opiate poisoning. Uh, they may die after the 10 days. Suddenly they may develop cardiac arrest and die and they may go home. So in such cases, how to treat, whether it's a treat as a medical illa or non-medical illa. Alkaloid poisoning. Okay. Alkaloid poisoning. When the patient goes home, the patient goes home. You, go home. you disturb okay. them, they go home. After okay. a week or two, uh, 10 days, okay. suddenly they develop cardiac arrest, they die. So how to treat such a patient? And they will come and approach the medical officer. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, uh, fine, fine, sir. So, one thing is like, suppose I will answer like, if death occurs in the hospital. So, if death occurs in the hospital and the case is registered at MLC, yes. so in all MLC cases, if death occurs, then the body belongs to the state, it doesn't belong to the relative. So, a doctor need not to uh, give the body to the relative. Because at that time, body belongs to the state. It is called as like, uh, it has to undergo autopsy only then. And clearance given from the police, only then the body can be uh, given to the relatives. So here, here if the death occurs, you have to inform the police. And once death occurs, again, you have to give information to the police. And body has to be sent to the mortuary. So they will do the inquest, police will do conduct the inquest and they will uh, do a medical legal autopsy. And after that, body can be given to the relative, not before that. Thank you, sir. It, is, it belongs to the state, goes for autopsy, and then it has to be given to the relatives. And other one, like if the person has been treated and has been 
discharge home and death occurs like within a day or two, and later the relatives are coming to the office and asking for a death certificate. So here we need, again we need not to give any death certificate. It can be declared as like broad death case for how the person was treated, and it is like a uh, broad for autopsy. It was a medical legal case, and for them to get a FCCD or the death certificate, it has to be subjected to autopsy, and only then uh, death certificate can be given. As a doctor, we need not to give uh, death certificate. If like uh, for giving death certificate, the question was like whether we should give the death certificate or not. Once the person has been uh, taken away, discharged, and sent away from the hospital, we we need not to give death certificate. Always better. To subject the body for not only dementia cases, in other cases also, we have treated the, the doctor has treated the patient and has been sent home. After that, after going like the same day also, and they come and ask for the death certificate. Better not to issue a death certificate in those cases. Better uh, subject the body for autopsy, and then the postmortem certificate can be given. For simple reasons like uh, suppose like the patient was sent home, uh, the aged patient. He may be wealthy person, so to get all this uh, wealth, then somebody would have like would cause suffocation or would smother the patient and they would have killed. And the next day they can come and ask for the death certificate. So we will not be knowing what happened to the patient once they left out of the hospital. So always better to subject the body for the autopsy and then to issue the death certificate. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. And uh, there is always some confusion. Uh, that is the uh, private doctors. You already have, you have told that, but still uh, to reinforce, I'm asking this question: Should private doctors report all the cases of poisoning to police or not? Because in some books they have told private doctors need not inform police in accidental and suicidal cases. It can be either a private doctor or a government. Doctor or working in any peripheral centers or the multi-specialty hospital to save him because I even like uh, there are so many legal sections which can penalize the doctor for not doing the legal duties. So it's better to save the doctor himself. It is to make a case to the MLC, MLC and inform the police. Either it can be a private doctor or a government doctor. It's better always to inform the police because. You, as a doctor, you are just informing the police. Later, all the investigation will be done, done by the police. Whether there is an accidental case, they'll restrict the investigation there itself. Or if they feel like if something is suspicious, they can continue the investigation. It is up to them. As a doctor, you are either in a private sector or in a government sector, anywhere, so the, all the poisoning cases, better to inform the police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajan, for uh, sparing your valuable time and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And we have a token of appreciation for you. Vote of thanks. Now, Dr. Viresh will give the vote of thanks. Thank you. As we have come to the end of this webinar, it's my time to give vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Points and Medicine and Toxicology. Annapurna Medical College in Hospital Sir. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to the Lord Almighty for His blessing upon me. And first and foremost, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our Honorable Chairman, Mr. J. Satish Kumar Sir, for encouraging us to conduct this wonderful session today. I extend my sincere thanks to our Dean Sir, VP Ma'am, MS Sir, DMS Sir, COE, and Director of Academy for their continued support and guidance. My special thanks to our Chairperson. Dr. S. Ramaswamy, uh, Ramaswamy sir, and our guest speaker, Dr. Rajan sir, for accepting our invitation in their busy schedule and for delivering an excellent and informative speech. I would like to acknowledge my thanks to our technical team, who is headed by Mr. P. Rajan, who is in IT department, for helping us in arranging a smooth conductor for this webinar. And my sincerest thanks to all the participants. Without whom, this program will have been a success. Thank you. Thank you to all. We have a token of appreciation for you, Dr. Rajan.
thank you. We'll now we'll, uh, race for a national nice. anthem.